Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is, it truly is a, a, a lamp under our feet. It is a light unto our path. In other words, it illuminates our very next step. But as we walk in that, it also illuminates our path and our direction and the plans that you have for our life. Father, you said in your word in Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God, it is a living thing. It is alive. It is a life-giving. It is life-giving. And it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And as we receive your word this morning, we thank you that it, it produces life in us, that, it, that there'll be understanding, wisdom, revelation that comes as we open our hearts to hear from you. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. And so we have our hearts and our ears open to hear what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Okay, I've been doing a series called The Power of a Seed. The power of a seed. From the very beginning, God created, um, even before he created us, he created trees. And it says trees that the fruit had seed so that it could produce after its kind. Vegetables and herbs that would have seed in it so that it could produce after its kind. And so from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, when God created man, the very first thing that he said, he blessed them. He said, be fruitful. And so anytime you hear that word fruit, that's fruit that also has seed in it. Okay. So be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So he's given this amazing command. And then in verse 29, he talks about how, and behold, I've given you every fruit that has seed in it for food and every herb or vegetable that has seed in it for food. And so God doesn't waste words. He's making a, a, a point, not just eating fruit, not just eating vegetables, but he's saying the things that have seed in it because that's the way that you're going to fill the earth. You're going to take it. You're going to take the seed. You're going to plant it. And so in Genesis chapter eight, it says that while the earth remains, there also remains seed time and harvest. And so God did not fill the earth with people. He did not fill the earth with men. What he did is he put a man in the earth that was filled with seed. And that from a man and a woman, that the earth would then be filled. So he established a law. He established a principle. He established uh, the way that we are to live our lives. And so I would say that in our own lives personally, we are filled with seed. Amen. Now we can choose what kind of seed we're going, to, um, we're going to sow into our life that we're going to plant into our life. Let's start out in Hebrews chapter, two, I'm, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 12 for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus begins to talk a little bit about, uh, about seed and starting in... Mm, Let's look at verse 33, starting in verse 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good. So, so basically, again, he's talking about the fruit that comes from a tree or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. Broad of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? And he's talking to the religious people of his day for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks a good man. Look at this. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So I'm going to stop there for just a moment because what he's talking about is what is planted into your heart. It actually then produces fruit in your life. A good man out of what he has planted in his heart and deposited in his heart and allowed to grow in his heart, a good man, he brings forth now, what does he mean? He brings forth good things in his life. Out of the heart, the Bible says in uh, Proverbs chapter four, 
uh, flow the issues of life. So what, what is planted in your life will determine. So like if you're experiencing bad right now, if you're experiencing pain, if you're experiencing hurt, if you're experiencing evil, then perhaps you're planting, you've been planting the wrong things in your life. You've allowed other things to come in. Turn with me over to uh, Mark chapter four. In Mark chapter four, and let's start in verse 14 for just a moment as, as we get into this. Mark chapter four, verse 14, as they bring this up. The sower does what? The sower sows the word, and then it goes on to say and begins to describe, look at this in verse 15. These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. Now we're talking about the word of God as being seed, seed, seed. Now, here's the thing about the Word of God. Just because the Word of God is out there doesn't mean that it's going to produce a harvest in your life. That's right. That's right. I will even take it a step further. Even just because you're hearing the Word of God this morning doesn't mean you're going to leave from here and get a harvest from what you hear this morning. I'll explain that. So just because the Word is planted doesn't automatically mean you're going to get the benefits of it or the good fruit that comes from it. These are the ones by the wayside where the Word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the Word that was sown in their hearts. Why? Because in Matthew chapter 13, when, they, when, when he's telling the same story, he says, because they don't understand it. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, uh, it says, wisdom is the principal thing. And so get wisdom, but with all your getting, get understanding. If you don't understand the word of God, if you don't understand what's being taught, then Satan's going to be able to immediately take away that word from your heart and it will not, it, it will not develop root. It will not produce fruit. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, rocky ground who when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. That's awesome. We come from a place like this. I'm like, this is awesome. Next verse. Look what happens. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Hear me well, church. Because of where we are right now, in the times that we live in right now, this is a word that the, that the Spirit of God uh, gave me to even talk to our leadership on Thursday about as we were having a staff meeting. I'm going to tell you what is needful for you right now is to be steadfast, is to keep moving, is to focus is not to allow what's going on, what other people are saying, what the news media is saying, what, you know, what, what, what has been going on in 2020 and, and the way that it's trying to move our eyes and move our hearts uh, off and causing anxiety, causing fear, causing dismay, causing discouragement, causing no hope. And there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people that are living their lives now and making decisions out of fear. And that's not what God has intended for his children. Listen, Psalm 91 says that with that a thousand will fall at my side and 10,000 in my right hand. But what? It, it will not come near me, but it says you'll see it. Which means... It's not just something you hear about on the other side of the world. It'll, you'll see it with people that you know. You'll see it with people in your neighborhood, but it will not come now you. It says that there shall no evil befall you. Thank you, Father. We're going to continue this, the story of Joseph here in just a few minutes, but man, this is such a heavy word on my heart right now. So let, so let me just encourage you for a little bit. Praise you, Father. Mm. Lord, we love you. Thank you. Look, it says here, the second people, the second group of people, they have no root in themselves. Now is the time to allow the word of God and allow your heart to dig and allow roots to be established in what God has said and what God has promised. More so now than ever before. Now's the time for integrity, yes. 
to lead you and guide you. I, I, I read this scripture last week, so let me read it again to you. Let's stay right here on the screen, but I'll read this. Proverbs chapter 11, verse three says, the integrity of the upright will guide them. The, but the perverse, perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Pro, uh, Psalm 25, 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. And so now's the time for faithfulness. Now's the time for steadfastness. Now's the time for integrity. Integrity where? In what things? First of all, your integrity as it comes to your trust and your relationship with the Father God. Being faithful, having integrity with what He has said to you, what He has talked to you. In other words, now's not the time to get distracted. Now's not the time to question what you believe that God has told you, the dreams that God has given you. Now's the time to dig in greater than ever before and not allow persecution or tribulation or trouble that's happening in the world to cause you to get off of the word. If you're not cautious in this environment, you will question everything. I thought God was going to do this. I thought God was going to do that. I thought things were going to turn out this way. I thought the prophet said this. I thought that. And you're swinging wildly, emotionally, and all of this thing. And, oh, mm, do I have to say this this morning? Listen. Listen, I love you. I, I love you. I love the church. I love, I, I, love, I, I, I love the body of Christ. But I have watched people freaking out for various reasons. And so what they're, and so what they're doing, and, and listen, as I say this, if this is you, this is not coming from a place of condemnation or, you know, or, or, or you know, I, it's not coming from a place of, 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 of putting you down or anything like that. I understand that, 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 we need, that we need comfort, that we need consolation, that we need, that we need, to, that, that we need our emotions stabilized. But here's what I want to say. Make sure in this season and in this time that you are drawing your comfort, that you are drawing your peace, and that you are drawing your joy from what thus saith the Lord in the Word of God and not what some prophet has said. Because what I'm watching happen in the Christian community is, is people hanging on to a, a word that this prophet said, a word that this prophet said, a word that this person said, something that was, was spoken. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but what I'm saying is if that's where you go to get your joy, your comfort, and your peace, the word of a man that is speaking for God, then you are looking to the wrong person because when prophecies fail and they will then where are you going to be when your prophet missed it? You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be upset. You're going to be dejected. You're going to be discouraged. But what if my hope is fixed completely on what God has said? What if I know that regardless of what happens today, what happens tomorrow, what happens next month, what happens six months from now, that God still wins, that God still reigns, that he is still the king and that everything that I am preserved in my integrity, I am preserved in him, that there shall no evil befall me. Praise God. Do you know Isaiah chapter 40 talks about... Um, God gave me this yesterday during prayer. Here, let me finish this real quick and we'll go there. I'm just, I, I just, I man, I feel in, in just inspired by the Spirit of God just to encourage you this morning to help you put your eyes on the right place, to allow yourself to get, you gotta, you gotta have root in yourself. Dig deep now. Somebody say dig deep. Dig deep. Now's not the time to change. Yeah, right. Now's not the time to question. Now's not the time. You never make decisions when, you, when, 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 you, when, when you're emotionally messed up. That's not the time. Now's the time to go forward. You know, in the middle of, uh, of, of, uh, of the sea, in the middle of, of the lake there where Jesus was asleep in the boat and the disciples, he said, go to the other side. What if in the middle of it, Jesus got up and like, oh, this didn't work. Let's go back. Oh, we need to go another direction. No, 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 no. Now's the time in the center of the storm to go all the way through. Yeah. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You lead me, you guide me. You, you're, it's going to be like in this place is where the greatest testimony comes. In this place is where the greatest victory comes. In this grace, in this place is the greatest time to watch God work in your life. Come on. We have the greatest opportunity right now for God to show himself strong on our behalf. If we'll stay, if our integrity stays intact with what God has said, God, this is what you promised me. God, this is what you said. And so right now, I want my roots to go deep. Where does those roots start? Ephesians chapter three. Um, let's go to verse 16. Ephesians chapter three, verse 16. Father, I just thank you for this word of encouragement this morning. Praise you, Father. Look at this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened, whoo, to be strengthened with might. That's his power. That's his, that's his strength. We don't live this life out of our strength. We don't live this life out of, how, out, out of how we feel emotionally in a given moment. We don't live this life based on what other people are saying and what other people are doing. We live this life propelled through life by His strength, by His power, by His truth, by His victory. To be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. Whew. You, have, you have His strength on the inside. You have his power on the inside, on the inside of you. You have more on the inside of you right now than anything that's out there on the outside. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than the politicians that are in the world. Greater is he that is in you than CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, or anybody else that would try to discourage you. Greater is he that is in you than your family members, than your job, than whatever else is going on. Greater is he that is in you than COVID-19. And the effect that it can have in your life and other people's lives. But do you live from that reality? Do you live from that mindset? Is that your default response when things come your way? Or do you try to hunker down? Do you respond in fear? Do you respond in, 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 in anxiety and worry and depression? So what do you do? It's like, okay, how do, I, how do I deal with all of this? How can I live from this place of being strengthened by my might or strengthened with might through his spirit in my inner man? Look at verse 17. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, look at this, being rooted and grounded in love. We just talked about roots, right? How do you dig roots? How, how do those roots go deep? You're rooted and you're grounded in the love that God has for you. You're rooted and grounded that he'll never leave you or forsake you. You're rooted and grounded that he'll give you direction, that he'll give you information, that he will, that he, that he'll absolutely, if, if you need to know something different, he'll let you know. And you're rooted and grounded in this absolute care so that you, like Jesus, can be asleep and at rest and at peace in the middle of a storm knowing that because God said, go to the other side, you are going to the other side. You are destined. There is a destiny point for your life. You are going to that place of destiny. You are going to that place of purpose. You, God has divinely in, created for you a purpose, a destiny, a plan for you to not just, not just for you personally, but to impact others. And it is sure. It is sure. We talked about Joseph. We, we started talking about Joseph last week. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 39. And Joseph, this is an amazing story. 
I, I, I was, um, I have a, and, and so I have something here called, um, it's called the Word of Promise. The Word of Promise, this is an audio version of the Bible, the Word of Promise. It's the New King James Version. You can buy it, I think it's like 40 bucks. It's an app you can get for your, for your phone. And, and so what's, what's neat, it's, it's, a, it's an audio version that uses different characters and things like that. For instance, Jim Caviezel, who played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ, he does the voice for Jesus in this Bible as well. But it's the full Bible with different character actors and stuff. So I was listening to all the story of Joseph uh, this morning. It was just, it's just amazing to me. But in, in, in chapter 39, um, so I just, I just say that as an encouragement. Check it out. Listen to it. It's because we're not going to have a chance to go through the whole thing. But the way that God just set Joseph up for success was amazing. So to recap, Joseph was the youngest of 12 brothers. He was loved the most by his father. His father gave him a coat of many colors. His brothers were envious and jealous. Joseph had two dreams that indicated that his brothers and his family would bow down to him one day. They were God dreams. He told everybody about these dreams. And so here it is, Joseph had a dream, but it wasn't just his dream. It wasn't that he came up with it. Oh, I'd like for my brothers to bow down to me one day. No, he had a dream from God. You have a vision from God. You have a dream. God has a dream for you, a dream for your life. Nobody is passed over in the kingdom of God. Nobody's insignificant in the kingdom of God. Nobody has, has as greater design and greater purpose in the kingdom of God. We are all the body of Christ together. We are all better together. We all get to experience God and experience life and enjoy life together. We, God has, has that for every single person. In John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But that's not who God is. He says, I've come that you might have life, Jesus said, and have it more abundantly. There's a plan for your life. There's a destiny for your life. Man, I don't know why I'm so on that this morning. I feel like that there must be some, somebody here this morning, a few people, maybe even watching by live stream, that you've given up on life. You've said, I don't know what God's plan is for me. I have no destiny. I have no direction. I don't know what that is. Hear me well. God has a destiny for you. There are no accidents in the kingdom of God. And for those that will buy in to what God says, listen, if I'd had half a brain at 20 and 25 and 30, perhaps I would have spent the time to invest in, in myself and to know what God was saying. But because of it, it took years for me to come to a place when I was 42 years of age for God to call me to be a pastor. And I don't think it's because God says my plan is for Mark at 42 to pastor. I think it's just because I was so slow getting to the point that I could finally be used by him. But here's the thing, but that's not condemnation. That's not woe is me. That is actually, man, what has he done in the last nine years of our lives has has, has so far gone beyond what happened in the first 20 some odd years of our marriage. I mean, God restored everything. Moses messed up the plan of God in his life. And so it delayed the plan of God in his life for 40 years. Moses wasn't even called or didn't even hear from God till he was 80 years old. But God, Wendy says, God, please don't let that be me, right? But at 80 years old, the last 40 years of Moses' life had more impact. I, so I don't care if you're 70 or 80 years old. Now's the time to thrive. Now's the time to impact generations. Now's the time. Now's not the time to say, I'm done with my life. Now's the time to say, my life is just starting. Let's go for it. Praise God. Come on. Amen. Look at this. So Joseph, so his brothers were envious. Joseph had a dream, a dream from God. And it looked like that his dream got derailed. But let me tell you something. If you will not lose, if you will not lose your integrity, if you will not, if you will not lose your faithfulness, if you will not lose your trust in what God has said, Joseph was sold into slavery. It doesn't seem like a slave now is in any position in a different nation now is any position for his, 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 his family to bow down to him. 
But Joseph was brought down to Egypt, verse 1, Genesis 39. He'd been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And look at this. He was a successful man. What? I'm sorry. You're, you just went into slavery, into a nation you didn't know its language. How can you be a successful man and still be a slave? Because success isn't determined on your status in society. Success isn't determined on your wealth. Success isn't determined by your ethnicity. Your su su success isn't determined by your upbringing. Success isn't determined. You can be successful in whatever place you are at that moment. Be planted, thrive, be fruitful because you don't know how God is going to use you where you are right now to influence others around you. Look, he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Let's go on. Verse three. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. This is where we kind of finished last week, that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now, Potiphar may not have known it was the, what God it was. He just knew there was something about Joseph that everything that he touched was successful. Do people say that about you? And you may, as you think about that, say, well, I don't know that anybody thinks that about me. But here's the question, do you think that about you? Because if you don't think that about you, then certainly nobody else will think that about you. If you don't see that you are a success going someplace to happen, if you don't see that where you are right now, you could be, uh, you could be a, a, you could be working at, at McDonald's. I'm not taking anything away from McDonald's, but you know, a lot of people work at McDonald's or a fast food place. And so society kind of looks down on that. Like that's not a significant job. I'm telling you what, you should be the best hamburger flipper that there is in McDonald's and so that people come to you for answers when they don't know what to do. In other words, you should be a success at whatever. If it's a minimum wage job, wage job then be a success in that minimum wage job because it will catch people's eyes. God will cause divine appointments to come your way. But it's when we, it's when we allow our integrity, when our integrity uh, can be bought when our integrity, when we say, oh, well, you know what? This job is not important. You know, I don't want to be here forever. I'm not going to be doing this forever. So I'll just do the minimum to get by. Jesus said, I mentioned it last week. If somebody compels you to go one mile, go two miles. If you were to think about your situation right now, if you were to think about your job right now and what, and what you are asked to do, if you were to think about yourself in relation to that job, do you do the minimum requirement? Do you treat your job with disdain? And do you treat your job with, um, you know, I mean, just contempt and your boss and those around you and can't wait to get out of there and can't wait. And I'm just doing this so I can just make money and because I have to. Or do you go in every day with an expectation? Father, I thank you for this job. I thank you that you've given me the opportunity to make money. Father, I thank you that I get to work on your behalf and co-labor with you in my job today. Father, who can we minister to today? To today? How can I make this company a success? What can I do to make this job better? Is there somebody else that I can help while I'm also doing my job as well? Is there somebody else, a fellow employee that is struggling that I could go and help as well. How can I be a success? Because I know you've blessed me. That's what the Bible says. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. It adds no sorrow. It adds no pain with it because you have uh, wisdom beyond your years. Do you go to, job with, to your job every day with that expectation? Let's all stay real quiet. Nobody has to answer that question, right? Yet Joseph as a slave still had the blessing of God on him. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made 
all that he did to prosper in his hand. Look at verse 4. Joseph found favor in his sight. How did Joseph find favor? How did you, what was it that caused Joseph to find favor? Listen to me. It was the fact that he was already successful. It was the fact that he honored his employer, his master. It was the fact that he only wanted to do good. It was the fact that he was going to uh, be excellent in everything that he did. He was faithful. He had integrity. It wasn't just because one day God talked to Potiphar and said, hey, I want you to promote Joseph. No, no, no. See, what God has put in you and what God has put on you, others will see through you and through your actions and through how you communicate, and through what you do. And this is the time, because of the dream and the plan that God had for Joseph, this was the time for Joseph to learn the skill set and everything that was necessary to learn how to be faithful over what belonged to another man's. Listen, oh man, mm. the, listen, the, I don't have time to go through the whole story right now. We'll pick it up next week as well. But the end result is that God elevated Joseph to ruling, uh, to vice president of Egypt in that whole region. All right. But Joseph could not have gotten there if he had not learned what integrity and faithfulness look like here. I have so many things hitting me at once. And, and, and so I want to make sure that we that we focus on what's the right thing. Thank you, Father. Look at this. Joseph found favor in his side and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. Let's go on. Verse five. And it was from the, from the time that he had made him overseer over his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Do you go in, is your, is your company blessed because you're there? Yes. Rachel says yes. <laughs> she works here. <laughs> Our church is blessed because she's here. Amen. Amen. Is, do you go in with that mindset? Or do you go in and say, ah, I'm just working for the world. And I'm telling you, it's time. We got to change the way we think about things. You are called to be salt. You are called to be light. You are called to impact. But see, here's what happened. I'm not going to go through the story, but basically what happened was uh, Potiphar's wife saw also the blessing that was on Joseph. And so she decided she wanted to seduce Joseph to, uh, to sleep with her. And Joseph, day in and day out, would say, I will not be moved from my integrity. I will not, I will not be unfaithful to God. I will not be unfaithful to my master. I will not, that, that everything else is in my hand. I will not take that which does not belong to me. Integrity faithfulness, wasn't willing to bend the rules, wasn't willing to compromise. And I'm telling you in this season that we're in, in this time that we're in, your integrity and your faithfulness and, and, and who you are as a Christian must be the priority in your life. Even in the face, hear me well, even in the face of losing your job, Because what Joseph did when finally he spurned her one too many times. And so, and so she was able to grab his coat the last time. And when he ran from her, she starts screaming, look, look, this slave has come in and has tried to rape me. And, and so she, she basically accused him of what he didn't do. It was a false accusation. And as a result of that, Joseph walked in integrity. Joseph was faithful to his master, but because of what somebody else did, it didn't look like that he was being set up for promotion. 
The master got mad, puts him in prison. So at that point, Joseph could have whined. Joseph could have complained. He could have said, you know, I try to do everything right, but every time I do something right, I get sold into slavery. Every time I do something right, now I get sold into, or now I get cast into prison. It's not worth doing what's right. Where are you, God? Why is that person getting promoted? Why is that person, you know, you, you know, uh, 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 moving forward? Why is that person getting, why, why, why are people jumping over me? Why do I never seem to? And you can whine and complain and are you willing to hold fast your integrity in the face of potentially losing your job? How committed to principle? How committed to the Word of God are you? Now, this is, a, this is a tough thing, but I'm telling you this is where we are in our nation. This is where we are in our society because of this whole cancel culture that has now permeated our society. People getting fired because they speak truth. People getting, people getting shut down because they speak their mind. And it even, isn't even people that are Christians. I mean, that happens, but it, it's, 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 it's pervasive now. And we, as the body of Christ, we're going to face those decisions. But if we say, well, I'm just going to be silent so that I can save my own neck. I'm just going to be silent because I'm going to save my job because I don't want to lose. Jesus said in, 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 in Matthew chapter six or, or chapter seven, he said, you can't serve two masters. You can't say I serve God and, and, and then also serve mammon or, or the world's riches or let money be your decision maker. He says, for you will either love one and hate the other or you will hold to one, you know, and despise the other. And this is, this is where we are today. So as we talk about integrity, Joseph kept his integrity. This is where I kind of want to uh, uh, fin finalize this and, and bring this to a close because what was happening in Joseph's life, um, and, and, and we'll, 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 bound, uh, we'll, we'll springboard off of this next week, but he learned what faithfulness, that belong, uh, what being faithful over what somebody else said or somebody else had, how that actually positioned him for the success and the plan that God had for him. It is in these moments of obscurity, hear me, it's in these moments where you're not being recognized. It's in these moments where nobody sees you, but God does. It is in these moments that you are developing the integrity, the faithfulness, the stewardship that is necessary, that will propel you. It's like what Wendy was talking about. It's like, um, uh, it's like in these moments, there's that stretching, there's that stretching that happens with the bow that, that you're saying, I'm gonna stay faithful. I'm going to continue focusing. I will not be moved off of what I know God has told me. I will allow myself to, to speak. I will allow myself to be a voice for him. I, I, I'm not going to swing wildly from one thing to the next. That while you're doing that, that bow is being stretched back, stretched back. And what will happen is like Joseph, who in one day went from prison all the way to vice president of Egypt. It's just like that bow was released. Boom. And instantly the target was hit. What God can do in your life in this season of preparation is in a moment can turn your whole situation and you're going to find yourself in your destiny before you even know it. But it's in this place. It's in this time. Moses, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph learned and had the skill set to manage Potiphar's estate in his house. So he learned skill. So he's, there's a dream. Listen, there's a dream that God will give you. There's anointing and a grace that he'll place on your life. Do you remember that David was anointed to be king when he was ah, 17 years old, something like that? Was, he was anointed to be king, yet how long was it before he became king? 13 years. Because anointing doesn't put you into your calling. Anointing doesn't put you into your place of destiny. Because there's a dream, 
there's an anointing and a grace on your life like with Joseph, but then there's a season to, to learn and to develop the skill that is necessary for you to be able to fill out that place, for you to, for you to be able to fill out the destiny that God has for you. And so even with Joseph for 13 years, he learned how to manage an estate. He learned how to manage a prison so that when, he, when God elevated him to that place of prominence and to that dream and that destiny, he had the skill and he, he had everything that he needed to be able to fill out that place. God didn't just take somebody who didn't know how to manage or how to steward and just say, well, you're anointed, so I'm just going to put you here. What are you doing to invest in your life right now? What are you doing to let God grow you right now? So many times people are just waiting. Well, I'll just go to church. I'll just keep praying. I'll just keep doing my thing. I'll keep going to my job. And so what, what happens is, is you're just waiting for your ship to come in. You're just waiting for God to do something when what you need to be doing is developing some skill, investing in yourself, thrive where you are right now so that God can promote you to your next season. Are you a success right now? Can you be a success in prison? Joseph was. Can you be a success as a slave? Joseph was. Can you be a success at the bottom of wherever your company is? Yes, because the blessing of God is on you. It took 13 years for David to develop the skill. He took a ragtag bunch of, guys, y'all can start playing. He took a, a ragtag bunch of um, misfits, outcasts from society as he's running for his life. And he learned and he, he caused them to, to become one of the greatest group of men, David's mighty army. He learned how to lead. He learned how to, how to change people's lives so that what he was anointed for as a teenager he developed a skill of leadership to be able to fill that anointing so that God was able to put him into the place at 30. Interestingly enough, I think David was around 30. Joseph was 30 when he also was elevated to this place. And so I wanna encourage you young people that are here this morning. There are 20 somethings that are here. And it really applies to all of us, but I, but but the Lord's really had our millennials on my heart because society, society looks down on that generation. People look down on our millennial generation. This is the greatest time for you to learn, to develop, and to allow the Spirit of God help you develop the skill that you need for the destiny that God has for you. Invest in yourself. Invest in and, 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 and thrive where God has you. And learn and know that the, that the dream is, is sure. That it will come to pass. If you're 40 something, if you're 50 something, if you're 60 something, never stop learning. Never stop growing. Never stop thriving where God has you right at this moment. Your life's not behind you. Your greatest days are ahead of you. You could learn a new language. You could learn a new skill. You could go back to college. You could do it. There's nothing that's impossible to you. Greater is he that's in you than he that, But what is God saying right now? Are you thriving? Are you a success right now? Would you stand with me, please, for just a moment? I just really feel by the Spirit of God that these are the times, these are where the people of God are going to shine brighter than ever before. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you that you've called us all to represent you, that you've called us all to have integrity, to be faithful, that you've called us all to grow and to get to that place. The destiny that you have for each and every one of us. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking you this morning just to reveal to each person 
areas that perhaps we haven't been faithful in, areas that we haven't had integrity in, areas that, that we can allow you to thrive through us. Those of us that are here today that have despised our job, that have despised our, bo our bosses, that have despised our work environment. Help us to change our outlook. Help us to shine for you. Help us to thrive. Help us be the ones that, because your favor and your blessing is on our life, that it impacts the department that we're in, the job that we're in, the company that we're in. And not just to do it in hopes that people will see what we do, but rather to do it because of our faithfulness and our integrity before you, Father, that we're going to be rooted and grounded in love, your love for us, that will then allow us to love others, even people that we think are unlovable. Lord, we'll love not out of our own ability and our own effort, but we'll love because your love is in us and we've received from you. Some of you this morning, it's time to make a heart change and to attack your job tomorrow with a new, with a new joy, with a, 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 a new freshness, a new energy. I'm going to thrive today. Thank you, Father, for blessing me today. Thank you for helping me be a light today. In Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord praise? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you.